The year is 2011, and you have been eagerly awaiting the new parkour shooter, Brink. You head to your local GameStop, because we still buy games at a store, pick up your pre-order, play through the game, and think to yourself, hmm, that was pretty interesting, and then you move on to whatever other shooters you were preferring at the time. This was the path that most of us probably took when Brink launched back in 2011, because the game was a disappointment. A disappointment that some people were definitely very hyped for. Sure, there were some people that enjoyed Brink, but many just found the game average or even bad and ended up just moving on to other games. Despite that though, I am sure there are some Brink fanatics out there, and today I will crush your spirits, because while I respect Splash Damage for the risk that they took with Brink and the innovation that they attempted, what came out was a greatly flawed product that clearly did not have enough time in the hopper. This though is something that I didn't actually realize when I was playing the game back in 2011 as a younger kid. It's something that I realized recently when I played through the campaign and the multiplayer, because prior to that it was a game that I just remembered with somewhat rose tinted glasses. Like I said I played through the game, thought it was pretty interesting and didn't really pick it back up. Good old nostalgia was clouding my mind, making me remember Brink as a much better game than it was. But we do have to give Brink credit where credit is due, and that is that it attempted to do something fresh and unique at the time, and be one of the first movement shooters, a subgenre which we saw explode in the later years with your Titanfalls, your Halo 5, and multiple Call of Duty titles that went down the advanced movement road. Brink was almost too early for its own good, though its faults also definitely helped play in its own downfall, because the game was far from perfect. It was also a game that for the time, tried to blend together single player and multiplayer in a way that was pretty detrimental to its own game. Especially when you consider Brink was not a discounted product, it was still a full price $60 video game. Recently I realized that the game is actually completely free on Steam, because for some reason, six years after the game was released, it went free to play on Steam, but not free to play filled with microtransactions, just basically free with the optional DLC if you want to purchase it. This allows you to play the campaign in full or multiplayer if you're able to find matches, something that was much easier when it first went free to play. This is exactly what I did though. I downloaded the game for some of my friends and viewers on my stream, follow me over on Arash Live if you want to catch those streams, to download the game with me and had a grand old spanking time brinking it out. Jokes aside, honestly we didn't have a terrible time playing multiplayer, though that may have more just been the camaraderie than the game itself. While the game is basically completely dead on PC, we were able to play some multiplayer matches which is quite the achievement looking at how fast the game managed to die out on PC and I can only imagine it didn't fare much better on console. So what happened to Brink that caused it to fall off like it did, instead of leaving more of an impact on gamers? And also, what is it like to play Brink today? These are the questions that we're gonna tackle, so strap on in, because it's time to live life on the Brink. All right, sorry, no more shitty Brink puns, let's get into the video. But before we do, I don't have a sponsor again for this video, so go over and check out my Patreon on patreon.com slash rash with three R's, you can see the different tiers there and the different rewards. Support there if you want to, though you absolutely do not need to. With that said though, let's get back into the video. Brink was developed by Splash Damage and published by Bethesda. The game released in May of 2011 on PC, PlayStation 3, and the Xbox 360. It was a $60 title that received mixed critical reception that really panned the technical issues that the game had, along with a severe lack of content in the game. But many of the reviewers were much more positive toward the actual gameplay and the different things that Brink tried. So while on Metacritic the game really averaged only a 70 out of 100, many do look back on Brink as a game that could have been so much more than it ended up being. So while it didn't necessarily do super well critically, the game was pretty commercially successful for splash damage, and as of 2012, Brink had sold over 2.5 million copies and generated $120 to $140 million in revenue. Many critics of the game panned the game for not being ready for release, but what's interesting is that this game was originally planned to release in spring of 2009, got delayed to fall of 2010, and then delayed again to May of 2011. So clearly there was some interesting stuff going on behind the scenes in the development of this game that led it to that two year delay. 
a delay that splash damage, even given the extra two years, was still unable to put out a game that many felt was totally complete. Brink was unpolished, unfinished, and unrefined, but regardless it had to go out, and that's what led to the game that many look back at and think that it could have been so much more. So with kind of some history of the development behind the game out of the way, I think it's time that we dive into my recent time playing Brink on PC, where I have completed the campaign and also played some multiplayer. But before we get into all the details about the gameplay mechanics, the story, all that good stuff, I do just need to quickly complain about the PC port for this game because it is absolutely horrendous. Now obviously I didn't play this game when it released on PC back in 2011, so I don't know if these were issues back then, or if they're more recent issues from trying to play an older game on more modern hardware that isn't necessarily meant to play a game like this. There is a lot of older video games that actually ran perfectly fine on older PCs, but do end up having a ton of issues on the latest and greatest technology. Regardless, we have to talk about it because if you're going to go and download Brink today, you're going to experience all these issues. So the first things first is the single player is locked to 30 FPS. Now for console games at the time that was very very standard, though for PC games not as much, especially when it came to proper PC ports that actually put effort into porting the game to PC. Now you can unlock the multiplayer which is weird but not the single player. The game also has extremely bad FPS issues. So like I said the campaign is locked to 30 FPS, but when I played through this campaign on my 3080, there would be times where it would drop into the single digit frames when I was trying to shoot an enemy, and that is extremely frustrating when it ends up getting you killed due to how badly the game is chugging and performing. On top of that, the overall menu just isn't really built for a PC. If you want to adjust the FOV, you have to enable the console. If you want to adjust your sensitivity on mouse and keyboard using actual numbers instead of just a slider, you need to use an auto exec. And you can tell the UI wasn't built for mouse and keyboard at all, with things like the command wheel that are clearly built for a controller. However, you can't even go and play with a controller on PC because as far as I can tell, the game just flat out doesn't have controller support when playing on Steam. There's a nice post on the PC wiki that can help you fix a lot of the issues that this game has. I know some people also have issues getting the game to play in full screen, so I'll link the wiki in the description if you want to check out Brink, but approach it with caution. You will have to mess with the game if you want it to run well, and even after I messed with it trying different FPS fixes and all that good stuff, it still ran extremely poorly. I just kind of powered through it because I wanted to finish the game. So what is Brink? Well, Brink is basically a class-based, objective-driven shooter heavily utilizing its parkour movement system, a movement system they call the SMART system, which stands for Smooth Movement Across Random Terrain. Basically, this is a system that tries to predict what the player is going to do and will help you traverse the map in a way to more smoothly perform kind of these movement mechanics. With basically the press of a single button, your character will slide under pipes, wall run off walls if you're playing the light class, clamber up onto high objects, mantle over slightly lower objects. Basically it gives you this more seamless movement system so you don't have to be inputting a ton of different buttons to be able to accomplish all these different movement mechanics. This is similar to a movement system that you'd see in a game like Assassin's Creed or even something like Mirror's Edge. Overall the movement system does work pretty well, though sometimes you can end up sliding under a pipe or something that you don't really want to, but overall the smart system is fairly useful and does make the movement a little bit more seamless when you're also trying to play a first person shooter. Besides that the game is an 8v8 objective based shooter. Depending on the level you're going to have a whole slew of different objectives and we'll talk about that later. All the levels are basically kind of transforming. We're not talking about objectives like a king of the hill or something like that but more so you have this grander level where you have an attacking and a defending team and the attacking team has a whole string of different objectives that they have to complete while the defending team is obviously trying to stop them. We'll cover this more later when we talk about the mission structure in the campaign, but these objectives can be anything from hacking a box, blowing up a door, escorting a POI, stealing a package, etc, etc. There are a bunch of different types of objectives in this game, but they end up all playing out very, very similar. 
Obviously the game is a first person shooter, so you're going to have pretty standard gunplay in that sense, though today the gunplay seems to kind of lack that impact that you would expect out of a modern shooter, but in 2011 I think this probably would have felt pretty standard for an FPS at the time. I will say the recoil on the guns can get pretty crazy, especially when you're ads I found a lot more success just kind of spraying and praying with the SMGs, hip firing and kind of running around, but I have to imagine that was more of a design choice rather than necessarily something messed up with the game. It's just not necessarily a game where you're going to be able to full auto the rifles and still maintain pinpoint accuracy. It also has that pretty fun melee system where if you slide into someone, it'll actually knock them over or if you just melee them when you're standing up, it'll also knock them over and you can take advantage of that time to be able to get a kill. So like I mentioned, the game is a class based shooter. This comes down to four classes and three different body types. The classes are soldier, engineer, medic and operative and you can switch between classes during the game at one of the command posts. While the body types are something that you have to lock in ahead of the game. The body types are heavy, light, and medium, and what this is going to control is your health, the type of weapons that you can use, and also your movement mechanics. The light body type is going to be the fastest moving character, but also the squishiest. They get the most fun movement though because they have full access to the wall running mechanic, while the medium and heavy characters do not. They can also climb the highest, traversing the map easier, and getting to spots that some of the other body types necessarily can't. Now the medium is pretty much right in the middle, you get some of the movement mechanics and you get a little bit more health than the light body types. You can also use slightly heavier weapons where you can use guns like an assault rifle where the light body type can only use SMGs and pistols. The heavy is going to be your slowest moving character and also the character with the most health and this type of character can use the more heavy weapons like an LMG. Now in multiplayer, most people kind of lean toward the medium body type because it's kind of the jack of all trades. You get a little bit of movement, a little bit of extra health, whereas when you play the heavy body type you move really slow, but if you play the light body type where you get full access to all those movement mechanics and you're going to move the quickest, you will be able to get shot down pretty quickly because of your lack of health. That doesn't mean you can't play a light body type or a heavy body type in multiplayer, you can play whatever you want, but reading different forum posts, it seems like a lot of people really leaned toward the medium type when they were playing multiplayer back in the day. Personally in the campaign, I stuck with light for basically the whole campaign because it's honestly the most fun to play with. You can wall run, jump off walls, do all that stuff, flank a lot faster because you're quicker, and you also can get to the objectives a lot faster since obviously you move faster. It also makes the pain of respawning 10 miles away from the objective feel a little bit less bad since you move a little bit quicker. There were a few missions in the campaign though I did switch to the heavy due to some of the objectives where they were basically out in the open and I wanted that little bit of extra health to try and be able to tank some damage to be able to finish out those objectives. So that kind of breaks down the body types. The class types are the soldier, the engineer, the medic, and the operative. The soldier, the engineer, and the medic all have a buff that they can use on themselves or their teammates. Each of these classes by default is going to have a basic kit that you can use to complete out objectives, as objectives in this game are going to be class specific. However, as you level up your character that we'll talk about later, you can get additional abilities and passives that will make your character a lot stronger, if you decide to focus on a specific class. So the soldier is going to be your more basic first person shooter character, your default ability is a molotov, and you can also get a flashbang. Your buff that you have is that you can resupply yourself or your teammates with ammo, which is cool because you're the only class that has access to basically unlimited ammunition. Now the soldiers are going to be the ones tasked with the explosive objectives like blowing up a door or basically anything that involves setting a charge. The engineer is my favorite class personally, and they're going to be tasked with building, repairing, and upgrading things on the battlefield. For objectives, they're going to focus on disarming enemy objectives and landmines. The default buff that the engineer has is that you can up the gun damage of yourself or your teammates, or you can also give your teammates additional armor, though you cannot give that buff to yourself. As you level up the engineer class, you'll be able to place things like turrets and landmines on the map, and there's also set MG nests throughout some of the different levels that only the engineer can construct. However, once you construct them, anyone on your team or any enemy can actually jump on the machine gun. Medics are going to be, you know, obviously the medics, and they're going to be the ones that are going to revive down teammates and also be able to buff their teammates' health or their own. 
the medics are extremely important because they're going to save you from those longer respawn times and having to traverse all the way back through the level. So having a good medic can basically be make or break whether or not Brink is going to be any fun. For mission objectives, they're going to be the ones that are going to be extremely important during the escort portion of missions, where if the person of interest gets downed, the medics are the only one that are going to be able to pick them back up. They can also give the POI additional health to make them a little bit tankier and hopefully not get downed. The last class type is the Operative, and these are the Spy or the Stealth class of Brink. The Operative by default can disguise themselves as an enemy to try and sort of sneak behind enemy lines, but you can also get abilities that allow you to hack turrets along with a whole slew of other things. They're also the only class that is able to spot hidden landmines. So overall, each class obviously has a role because there's certain mission objectives that require you to have that class on your team. Now this is both to the benefit and the detriment of Brink. So you can switch between these different classes in the game. However, as you play this game from game to game, whether it's through the campaign or multiplayer, you're going to level up and gain experience points, which you can use to purchase additional abilities. These can either be active abilities like the turret for the engineer, or various different passives that just make your character a lot more effective. One important note when it comes to unlocking these different abilities is there is the class specific abilities that you can unlock, or there's the general abilities that are going to help regardless of what class you're playing. Obviously, if you get a lot of the general abilities, then you can swap between classes with a lot less penalty, but if you try and spec into a certain class that you enjoy playing, like maybe you want to get the heavy turret on the engineer, then using those unlock points is something that you won't have at all when you're on a different class. The problem comes in the fact that you only get a certain amount of experience points as the level cap for the game is level 24. So if you're playing a character that you've kind of specced out to be an engineer, but then you have to switch to a different class to do an objective, you end up playing a class that your character is much less effective on. In a proper team environment, this wouldn't be a problem. If you're playing with a full squad of eight people, or even just a group of buddies, you can coordinate who's playing what class, and it isn't the biggest deal, because you can obviously switch between characters between games, so you can have different characters that are specced out for different classes. The problem comes is when you're playing multiplayer by yourself, or you're trying to play the campaign by yourself, where it's even worse because the AI is really bad. This is when you're going to have to do a lot of class switching just to be able to progress the different levels, because if you don't, you are completely relying on other players to complete out those objectives. Sure, sometimes there might be a side objective you can do, or obviously you can try and defend them, but if they're not doing the objective, you will just lose the level. There is absolutely nothing you can do about it unless you switch classes. With real people, this is less of an issue. You can use text chat or you can use voice chat to try and coordinate. And sure, someone might get pushed onto a class that their character isn't specced out to play, but you can probably make it work. The AI is so dumb, they just literally won't do the objective. They'll be standing there, running around all confused, literally flustered and unable to do the objective. Sometimes though, on the other hand, they'll run up and clutch up an objective when you aren't even aware they're anywhere near it. The AI is some of the most inconsistent and frustrating AI that I've had on my team in a first person shooter. Not only is the AI stupid and frustrating when it comes to the objectives, they're also just absolutely dumb when it comes to actual combat. Whether it's your teammates just being overly useless or it's the enemy AI that seems to just kind of blob up and attack you in swarms. None of the AI in this game seems overly complex, and a lot of that probably comes down to the polish of the game. A game that Splash Damage probably primarily developed as a multiplayer shooter. Because like we'll talk about in a bit, the multiplayer and the single player for this game are actually just the same exact game, except the single player campaign is full of bots. So along with unlocking all sorts of different abilities from leveling up, you also have a full loadout system that you can tweak for your different characters. This can go from different starting weapons like assault rifles, SMGs, LMGs, shotguns, snipers, and pistols, to the various attachments that you can unlock by doing challenges. You also unlock a good amount of cosmetics, both through just leveling up and through completing out the different challenges. And while it's not the most groundbreaking customization in the world, you can actually customize your character a decent bit. The story of Brink is pretty simple, and it's honestly pretty hard to get attached to. 
Basically, there are two factions, the security faction and the resistance faction, that are fighting over a once utopian city called the Ark that is floating above the waters of a flooded earth. This is a city that when you start the game is on the brink of a civil war. You have the resistance side which wants to escape the Ark, while you have the security side that is trying to quote unquote save the Ark. This all stems from the fact that this city is completely overcrowded. It was supposed to house only 5,000 people, but actually houses over 50,000. So you'll see from the resistance side, that these guys are living in poverty and that's why they crave that escape from the Ark. Now if you listen to the dev diaries here, they really talk up this system about how you have the two factions and you can choose whichever side you want to play. But in reality, it's kind of a pretty standard story. You have the resistance side, which has a noble cause from their point of view, while they think the other side is oppressors. While if you play it from the security side of view, they feel like the resistance is just a bunch of terrorists and they're actually in the right trying to hold together the city. You'll get little story bits at the start of every mission and as you finish different objectives you'll also get these little cutscenes but overall the game is very story light because the multiplayer levels and the single player levels are exactly the same with just the little cutscenes thrown in for the single player portion. Now the game does have two campaigns. You can either play from the security side of view or the resistance side of view. Each of these in the base game are going to have 8 missions with 2 additional DLC missions that got added on later. Now the kicker is that these 8 missions you're going to play are the exact 8 same maps, they're just from a different point of view. On one side you'll be the attacking side, while when you play through the other campaign you'll be the defending side. They even slightly differ up the order, I think maybe to try and kind of spice it up a little bit, but basically you're going to play these same 8 levels twice if you want to play both sides of the campaign. This is the same for the DLC missions and we'll talk more about those later, but those are also the same levels that you play from the two different sides. These 8 missions and 2 DLC maps, which equals 10, are the same 10 multiplayer maps that are in the multiplayer. The exact same objectives that you're playing in the single player, where you're just fighting against bots, are the same exact objectives that you're going to be doing when you play multiplayer, with the only difference being that you're going to play against real people. This makes the game feel extremely light on content, and also just kind of lazy. You also have to remember that they were trying to charge $60 for this game at the time, which is pretty insane when you have to think that the game basically doesn't have a campaign. It just has multiplayer missions that you can play with bots, with some pretty underwhelming cutscenes kind of thrown on top. It's funny though, because if you listen to the dev diaries, they really talk up how they blur the lines between single player and multiplayer, when in reality, maybe they just didn't have enough time to put in a proper campaign, or they really thought that this was going to be the future of gaming. Now that I don't know, but it is definitely one of the weakest portions of this game. Now each of these missions or multiplayer levels is basically a string of progressing objectives that you have to complete to progress or stop the enemy from progressing. We talked about some of the different objectives earlier, but things like hacking a box, blowing up a door, escorting a POI, stealing a package are all different types of objectives that you're going to complete during these different levels. Now these objectives are all extremely bland and boring, with some a lot more frustrating than others. Most notably the escort objectives, those are extremely annoying because the people you're escorting move extremely slow, sometimes just stop moving and seem to just get stuck at random times and they'll just get downed all over the place and you have to keep reviving them and it is extremely annoying doing those types of missions, especially in multiplayer or on higher difficulties where they keep getting downed. Basically all of the objectives in this game other than the escort objectives come down to some type of progress bar where you basically just stand by the objective and wait for a progress bar to fill up while trying to not die or get shot. Because in general, if you get shot while you're doing these objectives, it's going to kick you out of the progress bar and you'll have to restart depending on the objective or you can resume from your previous progression. That is if the enemy doesn't go and lower it before you have time to get back to the objective. So on the multiplayer side to win a level, you would need to complete out all the objectives if you're the attacking team, while if you're the defending team, you just need to stop them from completing any of the objectives. However, if you're playing the single player campaign, if you're doing a mission where you're the attacking side, you will need to complete out every objective, otherwise you'll have to restart the mission from the very start. While if you're on the defending side, mission length can completely vary depending on if you stop them at the first objective or if they get all the way to the end of the level before you stop them. 
And the same thing goes. If they're able to complete the whole level, you will have to repeat the whole level on the defending side. We also talked about earlier how the objectives are class locked, which can be a huge pain if you aren't in an organized environment. I talked about how the AI in this game is just extremely stupid and useless, but there were so many times during my campaign playthrough where I was getting so frustrated because I couldn't get the objectives completed on the higher difficulties. You'd have these long progress bars that you would need to complete out for objectives that are basically out in the open and the AI just won't do anything useful to try and cover you. Or if you try and provide covering fire for them, sometimes they just literally won't do the objective. They'll just kind of wander around, shoot random enemies, and so it can be extremely frustrating as you swap between classes to try and do all these different objectives and basically just hope and pray that the AI will help you in any meaningful way. These no doubt, and I don't know if this is a PC thing, are some of the worst AI I have seen in a first person shooter in anything that I've played recently. Obviously there's that alien game that has notably broken AI that people have talked about for years, but besides games where the AI is actually broken, this is some of the dumbest and worst AI I have ever seen. They're just literally stupid. We talked about how they're just useless when it comes to objectives, but they also just kind of suck at combat. It really feels like you're fighting bots from a mobile game. They just kind of stand there, take your damage, and you really only die to them when they just overwhelm you with numbers. You're never going to get outplayed by any of these AI. This can become extremely hard to deal with at some of the higher difficulties, depending on the objective that you're trying to complete. But it's not even hard to deal with in a challenging way that you feel like you've overcome it when you complete it. It's just pure frustration and annoyance. When you complete some of these objectives, you don't feel accomplished. You're just literally glad that you were able to do it and you weren't reset all the way back to the start of the mission, sometimes losing something like 30 minutes of progress. The mission structure, especially for the campaign, is absolutely atrocious. It really is just literally the multiplayer matches, but with bots thrown in and some cutscenes. A lot of the annoyance of not completing a challenge or getting stuck on a certain challenge feels a lot different when you're playing in a multiplayer environment because obviously that's kind of the point. But when you're stuck on an objective because you can't get the AI to properly help you or to even complete the objective, and you get set all the way back to the start of the level, it's not fun, it's just literally something that makes you want to close the game. During all these missions though, there isn't just one objective that you're going to be doing, and this is another thing that they really talk about in their dev diaries that they were really proud of, and that's how you have all this player choice. Now in reality, what it comes down to is there's a main objective, and maybe one or two side objectives, and then the command post that you can capture, which will just give your team a team-wide buff to either health or supply. These side objectives usually just open up different paths that'll make it easier for your team to progress to the main objective. Maybe give you a flank route or just make it so that your route from the spawn to the objective isn't as long. If you are brave enough and persistent enough though to complete not only one campaign but both of the campaigns, the game does have some quote unquote end game content. Though one could really question if it is really end game content in the same way you would expect it to maybe be if this was another game. The challenge system, which will allow you to do one of four different challenges that will allow you to unlock various cosmetics or actually attachments for your guns. Now in a lot of cases I like to think of challenge systems as something you do as endgame content. They're additional content to keep the game fresh once you complete it and also to add some replayability. But the weird thing is in Brink, you're almost incentivized to do all these challenges first because they're going to give you attachments for your guns that will allow you to set your loadouts exactly how you want them. A loadout system that honestly isn't too bad once you have all the attachments. What I do want to talk about now, which isn't really my strength when it comes to reviewing and talking about games, is the art style and the sound design of Brink. Now when it comes to the sound design, it's pretty straightforward for the time. Nothing spectacular, though I personally don't think the guns sound all that amazing. But from their dev diaries, it does seem like they went out and recorded a bunch of real life guns. So I have to assume these are probably pretty decent. Especially when you have to remember the game came out in 2011 and sound design has come a long way since then. There 
isn't really a notable soundtrack or anything from the game that really stood out other than the peaceful music that plays when you get downed and you're waiting for a revive. The art style on the other hand is a lot more in your face and a lot more unique, especially compared to games at the time. It's very colorful and over exaggerated and it gives you a look that is very brink. Now I think some of the characters are pretty ugly, but compared to some of the shooters at the time that had really gotten into that less colorful art style, Brink would have definitely stood out. This leaves us with just the DLC to talk about Agents of Change. Agents of Change came out in August of 2011 and was the only DLC to release for Brink. It was free for the first two weeks on all platforms to kind of encourage players to come back and play the game, and then after that it ended up being $9.99. The pack includes those two levels that we talked about earlier, which is going to give you two missions on each side of the campaign, along with new abilities, attachments for guns, cosmetic items, and raising the level cap from 20 to 24. Overall, the DLC really doesn't do anything special, but it does add a little bit extra content onto the game, so at the time if you were enjoying Brink, this probably would have been DLC that you would have enjoyed. The two levels that it adds on really don't stand out at all, they basically just feel like they would have fit right into the base game, so you almost have to wonder if they were cut from the base game, or maybe they were planned to be in the base game and they just weren't able to get them finished in time. This did bring the multiplayer map total up to 10, which is the total amount of maps that the game would end up getting, a number which is still pretty shockingly low when you compare it to other games. The DLC on Steam did bring a big jump in players, especially with that DLC being free. You'll see the game actually launched and hit about 17,000 players on Steam and quickly dropped all the way off into the triple digits. And then when the Agents of Change DLC dropped, it did get back over 10,000 players, but only for two days before dropping back off a cliff into the triple digits, basically to just never recover. That is pretty much the story of Brink. So is Brink a bad game? Today on PC, absolutely. I strongly recommend you stay far, far away from this game on PC, because with the frame drops and the performance and the technical issues, and the terrible AI, it is absolutely a painful experience, especially since you really can't play multiplayer. You're basically just limited to the campaign. But at the time it released, was it a bad game? No, not really. It just didn't live up to what it could have been. A game that truly was before its time, both in terms of the movement shooter trend, but also basically going all in on multiplayer for a shooter. Something that we see much more of these days. Titanfall even did something very similar in the following years, where the original Titanfall's quote unquote single player was just literally multiplayer matches. They didn't even bother with the bots, which was probably a better decision because the campaign filled with bots in this game is very, very underwhelming. Brink may not be a game that everyone remembers, but it is pretty easy to see some of the impact that it had on future games. Even Splash Damage's own future title, Dirty Bomb, which maybe we will end up covering someday. <laughs>